Good afternoon, everyone. Wonderful to see you all here. I hope you're all having a, a fantastic time at Davos. Um, my name is Mandy Drury. I'm an anchor with CNBC Television, and it's actually my first time here at Davos, and I have to say it's been a, a very insightful and uh, exciting time so far. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you moderating this panel. Let me introduce the topic to you. So the, uh, the topic is what to expect from the labour markets. And it might sound a little dry, but actually it's anything but dry, because I think for, for governments and for employers, and particularly for employees, it's, uh, it's going to be one of the biggest questions that we're facing in 2024. I think as inflation might be starting to recede as public enemy number one, uh, there is a lot of concern that maybe rising unemployment might be something that becomes uh, in its place. So we've, of course, got a lot of things going on. You've got seismic generational shifts in technology adoption, the green transition, macroeconomic uncertainty, all of it is conspiring to create a bit of an uncertain environment. So the World Economic Forum team has put together the Future of Jobs report. And if you just bear with me for about 30 seconds, I'd like to present the key findings along with the video. So first of all, they found as they studied 673 million employees across the globe, that 69 million jobs will be created in the next five years driven by the green transition and technology. Number two, that is gonna be offset by 83 million new jobs that are at risk from automation and economic pressures. So that means that one quarter of all of today's jobs across the globe are going to be disrupted in the next five years. So the bottom line from this report was that we all need to foster a culture of lifelong learning, and I think that's something that we're going to be touching on today. So here with their outlook for what the labour market will bring in 2024, let me introduce our wonderful panel. I have sitting next to me here, Gilbert Husun Humbo, who is the Director General of the International Labour Organisation. I have also Sina Lawson, who is the Minister of Digital Economy and Transformation of Togo. I have then uh, Robert Fitzo, who is the Prime Minister of Slovakia, and then Ayman Ezat, the CEO of Capgemini. So uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you for your time. I have questions for you, naturally, but we'd also love to take some questions from the audience. So um, shortly after a few questions from me, I'll open it out to you. So feel free to, to put up your hand, then we'll make sure that you can stand up, say your name, state your question and, uh, and put it to the guests. Also, if you're into social media, you can follow us along with your social channels with hashtag WEF24. So let's get to it, shall we? Without further ado, Gilbert, you're in the hot seat. <laughs> what trends do you think uh, the labour market will see over the course of 2024 that will result in material changes for jobs? Well, uh, um, first of all, thank you for um, organizing this, uh, this uh, session. And I like to take your turn that it looks really dry. <laughs> <laughs> that, so we start, maybe we should put some uh, spice to, um, um, to it. Yes, please. Um, in, in, in the session that I, I was uh, this morning, um, um, colleagues, uh, one of the participants um, used the term talking about the AI, which is one of the biggest elephant in the room, but saying that maybe we are um, overestimating or overreacting to the short term and underestimating um, the long term. And I think that was uh, uh, um, a very, very good way that I will uh, try to uh, paraphrase um, this, uh, this expression um, on that. We in ILO, we released uh, quite uh, recently our annual uh, WESO report, which is the, the World Economic and Social uh, um, Outlook. And you know, despite the turbulences that we are all um, familiar with in terms of crisis, uh, um, inflation, uh, all have you, but the job market um, has shown quite a very good um, resilience in uh, 2023. Um, the unemployment rate uh, um, stood in 2023 at 5.1% globally, down from 5.3% um, 5 uh, 5 um, 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 and and the, the, the labor market growth is also at 0.8%. Uh, um, and we even expect it to go to 1.1% um, uh, in 2024. Um, 
those are good news, I have to say, and we have to recognize that. But when you start digging into the data, um, then you start realizing that the vulnerabilities uh, remain quite, uh, um, quite there. Um, we project that the global inflation that, as I said, stood at 5.1 in 2023, might slightly uh, move to 5.2% um, in 2024 and 2025. And that slight move is already 2.2 million more people uh, unemployed in 24 and, 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 and 25. And also, when you start digging much more in the, uh, in the data, uh, you realize that the, the gender gap is not improving. And we still have um, 3.5. Um, I mean, if you look at the youth, we still have uh, the youth are still uh, much more at risk of being unemployed, 3.5 times more than the, the rest of the, uh, the adult uh, uh, um, population. Um, the data also show that um, 240 million workers um, remain what we call, what we call the, um, the working poor. Don't people that have regular job that the condition and the the wages are such a way that they are still uh, um, um, struggling to <clears throat> to pay their bills, and which is uh, quite very uh, um, uh, very uh, worrisome on on, uh, on that. And if you look at that in terms of the, the impact of the um, the artificial intelligence, of course, it has been the. the the subject of discussion in, in, you know, in recent uh, days, including the various reports um, issued, IMF, ILO, and uh, um, a lot of uh, reports that uh, have been um, issued on that. One thing that, uh, and again, I think you use the term uh, um, sayism, uh, a seismic uh, um, mm. um, reaction. Um, I would like to um, say that we do not believe that AI um, is going to be an you know, employment uh, apocalypse, an uh, apocalyptic uh, uh, situation on, on, on that. Um, although it is true that millions of jobs are going to be lost and millions of jobs are going to be created, but is the augmentation side, is the transformation side, and therefore I'm very, very pleased uh, that you, 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 you address right away the whole issue about the reskilling, upskilling, mm -hmm. lifelong. I'm learning. I mean, maybe I should stop here not to take too much of your time and you can come I back I think you've later. raised some excellent points, but I think the key there is that you don't believe that AI is going to be the destroyer of jobs to the degree that perhaps we're fearing right now. So then, Minister, let me come to you. What, what government policies do you think can support some of the changes that we're expecting? And to Gilbert's point, to make sure that we can skill our populations in a way that they can thrive and survive in the new jobs market? So first of all, um, I would say, first of all, thank you for, for having, having me here and, and giving me um, the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, employment, uh, and especially in Africa. Mm. Um, there are a few, few numbers that I think are very important uh, for everybody to know so that you understand what, what, is, what uh, is at stake here. 50% uh, of, of um, Africans are less than 18 years old, and 75% are less than 35 years old. So when we talk about employment, it's really youth employment we, we, we're talking about. So it's very linked to education and training and, and, and the skills. And, and as a digital transformation minister, the uh, the challenge we have is how do we, um, without having to reform from, you know, profoundly reform uh, our education system, how do we integrate new modules, new ways of learning so that we don't wait for 10 years or, or 15 years to have people uh, with sufficient enough skills uh, to take advantage of the transformation that we see today. And so this is, these are conversations we've been having um, in Togo, for example, in higher education saying, okay, uh, one thing that we think is very important for us is uh, to include more of computer science, and it's an umbrella. When I say computer science, I don't want to get into the details of which you know, uh, courses and so on, but uh, to, to, to add more computer science and make sure that across the board, uh, um, you know, freshmen, uh, start uh, getting this relevant education. But we have to do it at a very cost-effective, in a cost-effective way. 
And so we've been um, looking at um, online um, courses, online learning, and uh, we, we think that in the years to come, we, we will have a very strong focus on, on um, you know, teaching with online courses. But then the question is, how do we get um, you know, up-to-date, relevant content when it comes to technology? And I think it's through partnerships. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's, that's one thing. The other, um, the, the other thing that seems very important is that today, not only do we have a content, um, what kind of courses, training do you need to get issue, but for us, because uh, we don't have enough, I would say, teachers and so on, it's also linked to, the, um, to access to technology. So um, I, I was saying that um, earlier at another panel, the, um, the challenge for us um, in, um, in, in, in the government is that we have to deal with various issues at once and solve them uh, um, at once. We have to deal with um, a connectivity issue in the education sector. We have to think of training and content and so on. And we also have to make sure that our youth, because this is what is, uh, we're talking about, have um, the terminals, the device that can have access uh, to, to this content. And once we've um, dealt with that, we also need to uh, uh, attract these companies that are going to be hiring um, uh, our youth. And knowing that employment in Africa is going to be um, very different uh, in, in the future, in the next few years, from what it is um, in, in, in the global north, for example, we believe that um, a lot of the employment will be decentralized, mm -hmm. that people are going to be working from where they are. And so then the challenge is how do we connect to make sure that they can, you know, they can also participate in, this, um, in the global economy. And we've seen that happening during the pandemic. You know, um, prior to the pandemic, if you look at contact centers, call centers, for example, um, the model was that you would uh, be in a huge building and there would be 1,000 people or 500 people in a room um, delivering services and call center services. And with the pandemic, what happened was that everybody had to uh, go back home and from their home uh, and, and a single computer, uh, uh, they would continue to work. And we think that this is a model that is going to be um, the one for the future, especially in Africa where um, people will be able to work for larger companies but from, from Africa rather than having to, to be displaced in, a, in, in, in larger cities or different setups. And so it requires that we ensure that they have the, the right training, mm -hmm. that they have the, 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 the equipment, um, the good, a good level of connectivity and so on. I think you raise an excellent point about the decentralization of the jobs market and actually just over the last few days on CNBC we've been speaking to a number of uh, jobs related companies from Randstad to Manpower to Adeco and they all say that increasingly all around the world people are saying I would take a pay cut of up to 20% to get a better work-life balance, to be able to work from home, say, three days a week. So we need to adapt, don't we, Prime Minister, to what people want from their work. What kind of role do you feel in Slovakia, in your experience, what kind of government investments are also needed to be able to provide a foundation for the right kind of job creation? First of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Yes, I am Prime Minister of Slovakia, first time. And probably it is expected that I should be polyhistor, but I am not polyhistor. I am practical lawyer, practical politician, and uh, I asked my experts on labor market to prepare for me some documents uh, for today's discussion. And I have to say that I do not understand the text because of, uh, as I say, a language of the tribe, I do not understand. So please uh, allow me to be very practical and allow me to use very simple politician language how I see challenges of the uh, labor market in my small country, mm. country that is the member state of the European Union and that is member state of, uh, of NATO. First of all, since I've been in politics uh, since uh, 1990, 34 years, so uh, as a politician, either in the opposition or in the government, as a prime minister, 
I faced a lot of challenges. First of all, we had to transit country from the socialism to capitalism. It was very painful transformation with a terrific uh, impact on the labor, labor market in my country. Because you know, uh, the life uh, before 1989 was completely different from life after 1899. Secondly, there was the privatization in a such an extent you cannot imagine. Mm -hmm. All strategic firms, banks, everything was privatized. And I have to say that uh, uh, we do not, have, do not have in Slovakia very strong uh, uh, Slovak people in business. First of all, uh, foreign companies uh, are absolutely predominant in the Slovak uh, economy. Then, of course, uh, we entered the European Union, 2004. You know that the freedom of movement is one of the most valuable pillar of the European Union, so people really can travel, they can find uh, job opportunities uh, in other member states of the European Union. Then, of course, uh, crisis in 2009-2010 with a terrific impact on, uh, on the labor market. Then uh, COVID and uh, then war in Ukraine mm -hmm. because uh, we are a country, neighboring country to Ukraine, and uh, immediately after the war was opened, uh, thousands and thousands of people from Ukraine crossed borders and entered uh, Slovak territory. A lot of them, of course, continued to, to the Western countries of the European Union, but a lot of them stayed in Slovakia. They work, they live in my country. Of course, it has also, it has also an impact on, uh, on the labor market. Before I will be very concrete uh, about the situation in Slovakia, very briefly, please understand me, I am leftist politician. I am socialist. I was born in the family of a worker and a shop assistant, and I really believe in uh, these values. So please understand me that uh, I don't see the labor market as any technocratic uh, issue. Mm -hmm. This is for me a very important social, social phenomenon. This is also, uh, for instance, for me, is not political a goal to have a deficit 3% or public debt, debt 60%. This is only instrument for me, because I think that, f first of all, we should uh, do our best to help people to have a better living standard. So uh, my question always is not what people can do for labor market, but what the labor market can uh, do for people. Mm -hmm. This is my approach uh, to labor market in the country. Look, it is very difficult to predict what will happen in the next few years. Could we predict war in Ukraine? No. Could we predict uh, COVID? No. Could we predict crisis in uh, 2009? Everyone informed us, everything is perfect. Don't, don't, don't be bored, everything is perfect. In 2009, it was crisis of, uh, I mean, huge, uh, huge extent. So, what I, as a practical politician from Slovakia, can say is this. First of all, we have a lot of old people in Slovakia. And we need uh, approximately 100,000 workers from abroad. So first challenge for, for my government at this moment is how to attract uh, those people from abroad. So uh, we are going to adopt a lot of laws, for instance, laws that will shorten period in which uh, those people uh, can obtain all these permissions to work and live uh, in, uh, in Slovakia. Of course, we also are ready to adopt a lot of attractive laws, how to adopt rich people to Slovakia, to invest. You know, uh, we say it's a law on golden visa in Slovakia, and uh, this is instrument that is sometimes used in countries of the European Union. So this is the first challenge of the labor market in Slovakia. Secondly, because of this uh, digitalization, because of uh, 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 this artificial intelligence, it seems to me that uh, offer that is coming from schools, from secondary schools and from universities is not sufficient for requirements of business. Right. So we have to, I mean, accommodate what business really needs. But it's very complicated. It's very complicated because, uh, you know, a lot of traditions in the education. It's so difficult to mm. change all these uh, rules and uh, regulations that uh, we have. So uh, I believe that uh, we should uh, use the most powerful tool we have to solve these issues, and this is social dialogue. Absolutely. Please, I absolutely, absolutely believe in social dialogue. Mm -hmm. I love tripartita, we say tripartita in my, in my country, 
And I know that if there is good dialogue between the government, the business, and workers represented by trade unions, it works. Mm -hmm. If you ignore, if you ignore tripartite, if you ignore social dialogue, so it uh, doesn't work. So right. uh, I really, I really believe that uh, it is very difficult to organize or to prepare some plans for a long time. Look, uh, the unemployment rate in my country is about 6%. But uh, the majority of those people that are unemployed are long-term unemployed people without any qualification. This is not a secret if I say that we have a lot of social problems connected with the Roma gypsy people in Slovakia. It's about 8 or 9% of population in Slovakia. And total majority of uh, people belonging to this uh, minority, of course, are long-term uh, unemployed people. You will not believe how it is difficult to, to organize anything for them, just to persuade them, just to include them into, into, into labor market. So this is for us a long-term challenge. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I think that uh, some, something will happen as, as, yes. as usually, as usually. So I, I, I really do not have any plans for 15, 20 years. I have, as a practical politician, concentrate on issues that we have now in Slovakia. You're absolutely right. We need to be firing on all cylinders with collaboration, don't we? So, Ayman, let me come to you then and sort of pulling together some of the themes that we've been talking about here. At the beginning, Gilbert, you said that you believe that at the moment, um, when it comes to AI, perhaps we're overestimating the impact, but over the long term, underestimating. So, Ayman, how do we make sure that digitally enabled jobs will empower workers and not displace workers? Because so many times CEOs say to us, oh, we're going to use AI for our productivity and efficiency. I hear, hmm, they're thinking of taking out human jobs. Or, no, 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 we're going to use AI to uh, enable humans to do better jobs. But maybe over time, AI will be able to do those better jobs. How do we make sure that we're not displaced? So thank you for having me. So as a, you know, as CEO of a global consulting and mm. technology company, I'm dependent on everything because my job is to help companies leverage technology to transform the companies, to be able to grow, to become more efficient, to create more value. And at the same time, I hire a lot of people. I hire between 70 and 100,000 people every year. So I'm highly dependent as well on the labor market to find the right skills to be able you know, to get the work done. So if you think from a technology perspective, technology, first, impact of technology on labor is not new. I mean, we have been leveraging technology. You talk about office automation, you talk about office productivity, digital. It has been disrupting work for many, many, many years. So it is not something new. It's true that it both has both impacts. It has an impact in terms of creating jobs. It has an impact as well in terms of, you know, changing jobs, so evolution, but also replacing jobs. So we have to look at the overall picture, and I saw your numbers coming out of the, the, the survey that shows you know, there is creation of jobs and there is displacement of jobs. So, of course, the biggest talk subject you know, since, uh, since last year has been generative AI. Mm -hmm. you know. Why? Because it's enabling to do new things that we're not able to do before. And, and if you think about generative AI, yes, it's going to impact jobs, you talk about one quarter of the jobs are going to be impacted in the next five years. The reality is going to impact white collar jobs. Mm. Okay? And we talk about uh, customer service, we talk about sales, we talk about marketing, about communication, about IT. The reality is going to impact most, most white collar jobs over the coming years. So it will hollow out the, the middle white collar jobs, so like if Everybody you're a plumber gonna be or a painter no, or an even, electrician, Even the safe. job of a CEO gets impacted mm. because what I have access to today to be able to make decisions is going to be quite different compared to what I had last year and what I will have next year. So it enables you to make decisions faster, to be able to have access to new information, to have a better perspective and to understand you know, the impact of decisions. So all this we take into account. So yes. You go to areas like, you know, because this is the most used example by, by CEOs today, in a call center, it does increase productivity because I can, you know, generate even human, equivalent of human responding to customers, you know, around basically their request. So I'm able to increase the productivity. However, you know, I would tend to agree that the displacement of job and the impact is not as high as people think. Why? Because if this was true, that technology can impact so fast, we'd have many less people in some areas like finance or others than we'd have today. 
it takes a lot more time because you have something called the human factor and make driving change is not that easy. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree that people tend to look at, at uh, examples and use cases and from there drive straight lines of saying, if you apply to everybody, this is what's gonna happen. And I, it doesn't happen this way. I mean, we deal with that on a daily basis with our client. Mm -hmm. You know, going from an example or proof of concept to scale, it's a lot more complex and it takes time and you never get exactly all what you want. So I, I think it definitely gonna have an impact on a lot of the white collar jobs, but not to the extent that we think. The second thing, there are other technologies. Talk about generative AI, but you talk about you know, digital twins. You know, they had to increase safety. They had to be able to increase operational efficiency. We talk about immersive technology. So there's a whole list of technology, but it's true that in the short term, there's real obsession about generative AI. On the other side, you think about technology and creation of jobs. Look at the jobs created by, by, by green technology. I mean, we work on scaling gigafactories. There are thousands of jobs created by gigafactories, and there's probably more than 90 gigafactory projects you know, across the world. You think about renewable energy. You know, that's creating a lot of jobs. So AI, you know, there's new jobs. You know, data analysts, uh, you know, data prompters. So there is plenty of new jobs being created you know, but it's true that we're gonna displace jobs. And of course the question, at what speed do we create new jobs versus we displace, you know, mm -hmm. some of the old jobs. So it tends to be positive. And, and I just want to rebound on, the, on, the, on this concept of, of global work, because I think it's quite important. The concept of remote work has been enabled by digital technology. Sure. Okay, if not, we'd never be able to, have to do what we have done dur during COVID. And yes, people came back to a certain extent to the office, but we also have still a lot of remote workers. So I'll take the example of Capgemini. We are currently implementing a new platform to be able to have all our employees across the world on this platform with skills. Because our job is about deploying talent on, on client projects to be able to help them, you know, enable this, this technology transformation. So our motto is around what I want to achieve is anybody can work on any, on any role anywhere in the world, mm. okay? Right now, we had more the model in our business where we have people in global delivery centers in India, in North Africa, in, in Southeast Asia working for clients, but it was one-to-one -one in a certain way. What I want is, an, is one of my employees or architects in Sweden being able to work tomorrow on a project in Germany, somebody in France working on a project in the UK, but I want them to do that seamlessly. And I think the, the enablement of being able to do that remote work seamlessly, this is gonna enable to be able to compensate the issues that we have today around demography. We have aging population in the Western world. On the other side, we have young population in Africa, in a number of countries in Asia, and we need to find work for them. Traditionally, in white collar job, you move people. Mm -hmm. You have to have immigration. Today, we're gonna be able to do these high skill jobs remotely. And I think this is gonna enable to be able to do something new also, also in terms of basically boosting some of these economies mm. because we're gonna move the work and with it the high salaries you know, to, to developing countries and that should enable to boost some of the economies. So I, I see a positive future from that perspective. Indeed, we certainly also need to see less onerous regulation and less red tape in that regard. Uh, yes, Prime Minister. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, there is one practical experience from my country concerning uh, what you have mentioned, Amanda, that there are people ready to cut their income because of some advantages connected with the home office. A few years ago, um, we wanted to open issue in my country of four-day uh, working uh, week. Of course, we were immediately rejected uh, by business that it is not possible, not at all. And of course, uh, COVID uh, has changed everything because even now I know a lot of firms in Slovakia that simply continue and they leave people at home. They, re they realize those firms that it is very economically effective to leave people to work uh, in their flats, apartments and, and, and houses. And it's funny now to uh, how the opinion of business is going to change as far as four days uh, working week. Now, after COVID, after as they see those advantages of uh, people working uh, in their houses and apartments, uh, they are more flexible. And it, it, seems, it seems to me that Slovakia can, in a very short time, belong among those countries 
that will introduce uh, as an experiment, of course, mm. for Gabin Inc. Uh, four days uh, working week. At this juncture, I'd like to open it out to the floor if there are any questions from the audience before I keep on with the conversation. Would anyone like to ask a question? Yes, please. If you'd like to stand up, we'll bring over a microphone for you. Just uh, state your name, where you're from, and who you'd like to address the question to. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Nicola Hagleitner. I work with DHL, and I'm the CEO for the German Postal and Parcel Services. <coughs> and me. I have 200,000 employees, and I say that not to brag, but to bring the blue-collar workers also in. And I wanted to ask uh, to what you said, Jess, uh, Mr. Essert. We talk a lot about artificial intelligence and how sexy these tools are. <clears throat> my number one issue is that my employees say, our jobs are not being appreciated anymore. Mm -hmm. They don't quit because the parcels are too heavy or whatever. Nobody appreciates them. So they say, society, they don't appreciate us. During Corona, we were the heroes. Now nobody appreciates us. So while artificial intelligence for the white colors, I think we have the skills and we can mm -hmm. attract mm -hmm. them. But what does that do actually to the blue color uh, workers that uh, many of us actually have. Well, again, I, I don't think I have the universal answer to, to you know to your question. But I think you know when we look at what we are doing in in factories around smart factories, for example, to be able to enable digitally the factories. You know, yes, we're displacing work, but on the other side, we're displacing as well work which sometimes are heavy, are difficult, etc. You know, when you look at automation in, in steel factories or in cement factories, which are very hard jobs, here you're basically easing, in a certain way, some of these jobs. The second thing, I think, uh, digital technology can enable to enrich, you know, jobs. You, you, you have to think about it as being, uh, in many cases, yes, in some cases it displaces jobs, but in many cases it augments you know, what people can do. So again, I haven't thought about the postal office specifically, but we can think about ways where the jobs get enriched, where they do is more than what they do today, because enabled by technology, they're able to do more and get more involved in some of the decision making around routing or other that basically enable them to feel that their job has become richer. Right, so the augmentation through generative AI is a real subject in terms of, you know, enabling people to have more satisfaction as well in terms of the, the work they do by taking away some of the most, you know, mundane or basic tasks and on the other side, be, enable them to, to do that. And I, and, I, and I take the example, you know, uh, when you think about skills, okay, um, when we look at IT, so for us, you know, doing software engineering, developing applications and things like that is at the heart of our work. So we do tests. So we can think about generative AI as being able to code faster, so we need less people. But what we have done as well is taking teams with very basic employees in terms of skills and getting them to use generative AI. Suddenly we're able to get them to do the work, you know, of people who are more experienced. So we're able to augment them to do the work of more experienced people. And this, for the future of work, is very important because you're going to be able to take people with less skills, augment them with, with generative AI and get them to do, to, in a certain way, more satisfying and more highly skilled, more highly skilled jobs. That's an excellent question, and I'm really glad that you raised that because we're not just seeing desires for work-life balance. We're seeing desires for mental health and emotional health support and appreciation. So we can't forget mm -hmm. our humanness in all this automation. Gilbert, you wanted to add something to this. Yeah, I, I just want to come back. I mean, the the, the, the point that you are raising, very valid point. Uh, remind me the point that. Uh, Prime Minister Fico was also mm. making that. In fact, let me remind you what ILO uh, uh, Constitution and the Philadelphia Declaration 44 says. You know, labor is not a commodity. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the key things here is to bring a, the, the human-centered approach. So somehow AI will, whether we like it or not, will force us to bring back um, the human dimension at the center. Uh, and in addition, and I wholeheartedly support what uh, the CEO of uh, Capgemini was uh, I'm saying in terms of augmenting um, through the, the lifelong learning and the, the, the reskilling. Re um, but at the same time, um, yesterday, um, um, one point that was interesting uh, also discussed is today, who is able to use AI 
is the one that will replace the job of who is not able to even understand technology uh, in, in that. So it's not AI that is taking away your job. It's your ability or inability to understand or to work with it in the short, in the, in the, in the, in the short mm. run. So I cannot insist enough in the uh, lifelong uh, um, learning. Mm -hmm. Um, link to um, um, link to that, you know, one point also that came out in the in the discussion is this uh, demographic um, um, change and the fact that you know we have um, um, skill shortage on um, labor shortage on one hand and uh, mm -hmm. excess of uh, um, skills on the other hand, um, you know, global north, global south, aging population, etc. And the challenge, on one hand, with AI, you may not need a, a call center. Uh, in India or Morocco. On the other hand, you could, and Cape Gemini can offer a job to a young Togolese mm -hmm. in Lome that doesn't have to migrate. Mm -hmm. So the whole debate on the labor migration, that itself will structurally have to evolve on that. And we have to be ready to have that kind of win-win discussion in terms of labor migration and the, the, the care economy and the aging of the population. You said labour shortage, and I'm wondering, Minister, what we're going to see in 2024? Because remember when we had the great resignation directly after the pandemic, you know, airlines couldn't fully take off, restaurants couldn't fully open, there was a massive shortage of available and healthy workers. Is that going to start flipping around this year? And what's the experience that you're seeing in Togo? Um, so with regards to the, to the, obviously we, you know, we also are, are part of, um, I mean, we, we, we were, a, we faced the consequences of some of the, you know, political crisis in, in, in the region and, and, and so on. I would say that again, with regards to, uh, uh, to the labor market um, and, and the whole of, of West Africa uh, economy was also impacted by inflation and so on. I think that um, it's going to be um, a, a lot of the focus that we have again are around education and training. We do have a, a reskilling um, issue that we are, we, we're dealing with as a as a region and as a continent. And I also think that a lot of the conversations with regards to not only unions but. Uh, uh, the education, uh, the, 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 the education system is taking place right now as to um, on how to modernize this education system. We know that it takes a lot of time. Um, we know that um, our, um, our youth um, may not have the right skill set right now because when we're talking, we talk about AI, we talk about new technologies, it, it also has impact on the way they were trained and uh, there's a lot of work that uh, is being done uh, uh, right now, but uh, again, the, the, the issue is how do we uh, determine uh, the training that is required? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's not a mundane issue. I mean, because finding the right content and the right partners to, for this type of training is extremely hard. And then the second question is that when, um, when you see contractions in the global economy, then it does have an impact on the on, on the continent as well, especially when you look at um, um, I would say uh, white collar jobs on the continent. Uh, that's also something that uh, has been uh, on top of our our mind. I would say, mm. but but again, having um, the, the the Ministry of Digital Transformation has this mandate to connect. We're talking about you know, uh, staying, for example, in Togo and being employed using the global platform of Capgemini, it forces us to make sure that um, we have broadband everywhere, stable broadband. So it also has um, an impact on the type of investment that we need to support because we realize that the private sector alone cannot do it. And so again, uh, after having left um, the uh, in investment in, 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 in infrastructure, telecom infrastructure, we, le we left it um, to the private sector in the 19, I mean, the year 2000, and, and the, for the past 10 years, it, it was always well uh, 
with the private sector investing in, in, in infrastructure. And now we realize that because our real challenge is employment and we need broadband, stable broadband in order to connect these youth to the job market, then we have to also support this type of investment, which was not, I would say, planned a decade ago. So it forces us to find new uh, financing models to finance this infrastructure. So uh, when we just take the employment issue, that's where we see that it's connected to so many different issues that we, again, have to solve to make it work. So many, it's a very multi-pronged approach, isn't it? We've only got time for one more question from the audience. Yes, sir, we'll bring over the microphone for you. Thank you. My name is Atle and I'm the General Secretary of Industrial Global Union, which represents practically all organized industrial workers in the world, mm -hmm. white collar, blue collar. Mm. Uh, but my question goes to the reskilling, because we saw the number of jobs that are going to go away and the number of jobs that are going to appear. From our side, of course, we were hoping that the people who may lose their jobs will get the new jobs, but that's not necessarily the, the truth. But the problem is, how are we set up when it comes to reskilling uh, generations? Mm -hmm. And we know uh, that uh, blue collar workers are less likely to want to take further education. There's less pressure on blue collar workers to do so. White collar workers are more eager to do it, and there's more uh, on offer for them. Mm -hmm. But we need to get everybody on this wagon. So the question goes to everybody, but the ministers, first of all, your countries, are they set up to do this job? and to Cup Gemini and the ILO, how is the global picture? It's a, that's an excellent question. May I just say, we've only got three minutes left and it is a hard out. So if we can just, I'd like a thought on that topic from each of you, but just keep the questions concise, please. Your answers concise. Okay. I'll leave it to you. Gilbert? <laughs> I, I mean, um, the, 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 the question is, is, is critical. I, the way I will say it, I think we have to recognize that both in terms of uh, scaling, upscaling, and addressing the peculiar situation of the blue um, color that the colleague from uh, um, Germany was raising, we are behind. Let's, you know, it's just like the whole policy dimension when we talk about AI. So we are behind. So I can only ask the uh, Director General of ILO really um, advocate for more investment in those, tra uh, in those training from the blue color to the white color. Mm. Thank you. Minister? <coughs> Um, I, I, that's, that's a very good question, and that's a very difficult one, be, especially because it requires, uh, I would say, local participation. Because you can't reskill blue collars from abroad taking contents somewhere. You really need the participation of, of the blue collars, I don't know if it's associations and so on, so to rethink through how the reskilling would look like. And I would say that um, we're not there yet. Um, and. Um, I would also say that what we need is maybe a methodology to get there, mm. which is not so easy to think even through it, I would say. So, so that's why it's challenging, because not only do we need to think through it and try to understand how we do it, but we also need to have the people who can actually do it and make it happen. And these are two difficulties, I would say. Thank you, Minister. Prime Minister? Once again, practically, you know that we have... Uh or we had in my country a lot of companies that uh, had to be closed. For instance, mines in Slovakia. And uh, I have to admit, uh, all programs, how to refix those people from mines to, let's say, normal standard working conditions uh, uh, were uh, not successful in my country. So uh, this is something we do not have a very effective medicine in my country. At this, at this moment. Mm. So I fully understand. What so I, I, very quick, the opportunity and a challenge. The opportunity is today with immersive and digital technologies, you can train people 95% remotely. That's the opportunity. The challenge is how to organize in a way that your people are able to learn fast enough. And the second thing, how to create the incentive for people to want mm. to learn. Mm. Just half, half a minute. Absolutely. Just, you know, and the Prime Minister also touched on that earlier, and I thought you were going to bring that up, is the social dialogue dimension of all we are discussing. Mm. You see, what we're saying, we can organize everything, the platform and so forth. If the blue collar or the white collar do not want to have that training, mm. you, 
you, you won't be able to, um, to, to, to make it, you know. You can bring the animals to the river, but you cannot force them to drink mm. on, 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 on that. So it, it's important for us to have that kind of social dialogue to make sure that we can incentivize all of us. Absolutely imperative to have the dialogue and to turn that dialogue, the talk, into action as well, isn't it? On that note, I do believe that our session has ended all too quickly. I do thank our panelists very much for your conversation. I learned a lot and I hope that the audience did as well. Thank you. Let's give them a round.